Good morning. We've all had our coffee and we're awake, right? I am. Oh, if you want. Microphone. I seldom need a microphone. Okay. Can you put it right there? Hey, um, as Bernard said in my um, in his very nice introduction, um, I started portraying Eliza. It's not. It, it is on. I can hear it. <laughs> we, it really has to be closer to you. Yeah, I guess yeah. I have to hold it down. Yeah, sorry. It's all right. It's okay. You look so good with it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. The um, Living History Program at Sutter's Fort started in 1980. Um, I was one of two people who started it. Uh, I'd never done Living History before. But the man that I worked with at the time said, this is the best way to explain to people what life was like in the past is to essentially embody a person from the past. So uh, we started this program in 1980 and we encouraged everyone who was participating to adopt a character, a real person from the past, if they could find one that they felt they could portray. Because we had a man who was portraying Captain Sutter, we had people who were portraying other individuals who were not known people. Finding a woman to portray is much more difficult because women's lives in the mid 19th century were like barely a blip in a historic record. I mean, if you were lucky, you had you were Mrs. So and So. That's all all you had to work with. Um, so I was trying to find a real person that I could portray because I wanted to set an example for the other people in the program as being one of the organizers we kind of have to do that. So um, at the time I was working for California State Parks in the Office of Interpretive Services. And we had an extensive library of all kinds of both natural history and historic resources. So I was in the library for some purpose that wasn't related to this and I found this um, book in the library and it was called the Gregson memoirs it's uh, the containing Mrs. Eliza Gregson's memory and the statement of James Gregson and so I picked it up I said what's this and I read the foreword in there and it says that um, at the time that um, a man named Hubert Howe Bancroft was collecting, you're nodding your head, you know who that is, um, who was collecting information about California's history, um, he sent out clerks all over the state of California to interview people who had been, to, been in California before the gold rush. Because gold rush and later you get lots of research, lots of information that's not difficult to find. But pre-Gold Rush, it's much more difficult to find. So he sent these clerks around the state to interview the men who had been here prior to the Gold Rush. What year was it? Um, 1876 or so. And so one of those clerks came and visited the Gregson farm and interviewed Eliza's husband, James. I don't know how long they talked, but he dictated information and, and that statement is in the back of the Gregson memoirs. And he left. He didn't interview Eliza. He said, wait a minute. I had just as much to do with the settling of California as my husband did. And as all the other people who were in California did. So she started writing down what she called her memory on the backs of bills, on backs of letters, scraps of paper, and all that kind of stuff. And the family kept them. And um, after she had died, she died in 1889. After she died, um, one of her daughters had been the one who ended up with the envelope of pieces of paper. And a younger a granddaughter named Augusta Gregson Cunningham had um, gone to business school against her parents' wishes, by the way, had gone to business school and learned how to type. And she gave it to her, I think it was her niece, gave it to her niece and said, can you make sense out of this? Because it was scraps of paper. They weren't numbered, like page one, page two. It was not numbered. 
and some there were dates and some there weren't. And she said, can you transcribe this so that it can be read? So Augusta did that. And um, she, she did it verbatim. She did not change the spelling, which was not the greatest. She didn't change the punctuation, also not the greatest. She didn't change the sentence structure, again, not wonderful. Um, she wrote it, or typed it, exactly as Eliza had written it, and tried to put it in some sort of chronology. So she did that, and you realize when reading this, because it was then printed by the California Historical Society in um, June of 1940. When you read it, you realize this woman had some education, but not a lot. I mean, she'll spell words, what the heck is that? And then they'll be in parentheses, that's what the word is. Because she was spelling things as she would say them, not um, according to any prescribed notion of correct spelling. And something that I made, was made increasingly aware of is standardized spelling for words didn't really take place until the latter half of the 19th century. Up till then, it was kind of like, well, we think it sounds like this. And it's words that were French would be spelled phonetically as if it was English. It was not the best way to, to learn English. So people would learn whatever their school master told them. And we don't know, there is no record of Eliza getting any formal education. So I don't know what she had. She had enough that while she was at Sutter's Fort, there were a couple of women there who, um, she said, in her memoir, she mentions that she um, was visiting one of her neighbors and that woman had been teaching her daughters their letters, but she didn't know how to write. So she asked Eliza to teach them how to write. So she at least knew enough to write things down and to be able to record things. And that information is included in her memoirs. So this is a real person. This is somebody who experienced things that other people were experiencing, but she saw it from an ordinary person's point of view. She was not John Sutter. She was not James Marshall who discovered gold. She was not Captain Fremont who came and started, and I won't say started because nobody knows for sure, um, <laughs> who was instrumental in the Bear Flag Rebellion. She was not that person, but she knew those people. She met them, she interacted with them to some extent, but she, she was an ordinary person. She was not born in the U.S. She was born in uh, Manchester in England. And the pronunciation for Manchester's prop or county is? Manchester. Uh, no, it's it's uh, Lancashire, isn't it? Uh, Derby is south of Manchester. That, right, that, but that, Lancashire is where Manchester is, correct? Yes. Okay. He, he helped me there earlier today. <laughs> so she was born in England and came to the United States and when she was 15 with her family. For more about that, read the book. Um, she, they settled in Rhode Island, where her father was working in a textile mill, and so she and her older her brothers and sisters got jobs in the textile mills at the same time, and so they, she worked in the textile mills there until she was um, twenty, no, nineteen, and then she met a young man who had also come from England. And they got married and moved to where his family was living, which was in Philadelphia, lived there for the first six, eight months of their marriage, and then decided to go west. Because, as she said, her husband was not very stout, is what she meant, said, which meant healthy. And that she was worried that his working in a dark, dirty factory was not going to be good for his health. Um, so she to her, this was a great idea. We're going to move west. So they went as far as Illinois. And they got they got to Illinois and were only there for a year. Um, her mother and um, two brothers and a sister joined them, for reasons I won't go into because it's in the book. Um, <laughs> so and they came west from Illinois. They came west. And so she, I started portraying her as an arrival to California in um, 18, excuse me, I'm gonna get 18 and 19 mixed up, in uh, 1992, which is 82, 1982, which is when I started portraying her. And then, as Bernard uh, said, when um, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip and their entourage came in 83, I was tasked with providing 
uh, Prince Philip was a guide. So I was his guide around the fort. We followed the queen and Captain Sutter was guiding her because he's the boss. He gets to take the boss lady around. So they guided them around and, and being a good previously British subject, I gave paid a curtsy and all that. And we following around them and I what do you talk to a prince about? I know polo. Sorry? Polo. <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing about polo. That would never have worked. Um, so I started talking to him and babbling away as a, uh, a young and impressionable thing. Um, said something to him about being glad to hear uh, English spoken correctly. <laughs> and I cannot do a British accent. Can't even attempt it. Any accents. I'm really bad. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you're from England. I said, yes, sir. She, he said, you've lost your accent. <laughs> um, 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 well, I, I've been here since I was, I think I said 12 at the time. And I've lost somebody because, oh. <laughs> so we did the rest of the tour. But um, so what, what was really interesting to me was Eliza is a real person, ordinary person, everyday person. She's not rich. She's not famous. She's just like all of us. So her point of view on what it was like to be in California, to grow up in England and come across the ocean and come to California was really useful information. Um, is particularly for someone who's trying to portray someone who has done that in the year we used it before, it was 1846. So I could speak knowledgeably about what life was like excuse me, in the United States in 1845 because I had something to work with. I had her memories in this book. So, um, as I said earlier, her granddaughter, Augusta Briggs and Cunningham, was the one who transcribed the notes. About six months after the Queen visited, of course it was in the papers, um, the fort got a letter from this young woman, this not young at the time, older woman saying that she was Eliza's granddaughter. And she wanted to meet the person who was portraying her grandmother. So it's Augusta Gregson Cunningham, who was born after Eliza died and after James died. So she did not know either of her grandparents. She did, however, know Eliza's younger sister, who was still alive when she was growing up. So she remembered Aunt Marianne who was, um, she said she was a little thing, little bitty thing with white hair and always had a book at her side. So, okay, this family may not have had formal education, but they definitely knew how to, to read. Um, I discovered during the research for this that Eliza's mother, however, did not know how to write because when the baptismal record was signed for Eliza, she just put an X, which means you didn't know how to write, you just put an X. So, Eliza, Augusta had done, um, at the time when she was, at the time I met her, she was in her 80s. And coincidentally, was about the age of my own grandmother. So I went and visited her, did an oral interview with her, wonderful information, transcribed it all. Um, she took me to um, where the family had lived in Sonoma County. And she took me to where the gravestones are it was very odd standing at the foot of Eliza's grave, saying her name going, I'm you now. This is, this is really odd. Um, she told me about stories of their life that she was told when she was a girl um, and where she had, because they would used to go and visit the farm, family farm because her father had taken over the house when both his, his parents died, when James and Eliza died. He was the one who took over the farm. So they would go out there and visit the family farm and, and um, she knew about what they grew and where things were, crops were and where the buildings were and all this kind of stuff, excellent information. Um, she would do a program for local groups like local historical societies. She would dress up like her grandmother and do a program and essentially did a synopsis of what Eliza wrote in her memoirs, where, where she was born. I'm Eliza Gregson, I was born in Manchester, Lancashire, et cetera, et cetera. And she had a, um, a dress that she had patterned after the one that Eliza is wearing in the picture on the front of the book. Since you don't all have copies, that's the dress that Eliza is 
Thank you. Oh, now you took it away. I was trying to put oh, it oh, away. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. She made a dress pattern after um, the dress that Elias is wearing in the picture. And um, an apron that had lace around it that she said was lace that Eliza had knitted. Hmm. I don't know what happened to that apron. I would really like to see it again. Um, so I took that information home with me and wrote it all out. It gave me a lot more information about about Eliza's point of view and family stories about her and all that. Like one of the family stories that um, that she didn't write about in her memoirs, but Augusta told me is one night it was really horrible stormy weather, etc. And um, there was a prayer meeting at their preacher's house, and Eliza was determined to go. And her husband says, "Nobody's going to be there. It's pouring. It's horrible outside." She says, "No, I'm going. I have to go." So she went. And she got there, and it was the the minister and his wife and her. There was only three of them. But you know, they had to find me. And she goes home, and her husband says, "How was the meeting?" And she said, "It was a goodly company. You know, choose company. See, they had a crowd, right?" So it's just little tweaks of her her humor that I never would have known anything about. Now I don't know how accurate that is because it's hearsay. It's what Augusta was told a couple, you know, a generation later about what was going on. So. Augusta, um, she used to call me at work and she would call in her old lady voice and ask to speak to her grandmother. And the people I work with knew about this, so they would send her to me. So she called me grandmother and I called her granddaughter. Um, she, she passed away in 1999. So, um, you know, I felt like I lost my second grandmother there. Um, her, one of her descendants, um, well, a Gregson descendant, oh, she was, she used to call that's her aunt, so she must have been an aunt. Um, Lori Gregson Edgars, a descendant who still lives in the neighborhood, held a lot of family photographs, shared family photographs with me, and has a lot of family information. In fact, coincidentally, she is, I'm not sure what her exact job title is, but she has something to do with the cemeteries in that area of Sonoma County, including the cemetery that James and Eliza and her, Eliza's mother and her brother's and sister are all there again. So it's still there, as far as I know. I haven't been in a while. Um, then a year later, in 1984, the fort was visited by a man named Jeffrey Tinnington and his wife, who were from England. And um, Jeffrey had been born in Bolton, which I think is in Lancashire. It is, thank you for that. Um, and he saw that um, there used to be a picture on the wall in the Forts Museum that said James and Eliza Gregson born Little Bolton, Lancashire. And Jim said, well, that's where I'm from. And so he went back, he went back to, to England and wrote a letter to the fort saying, I want to know more about these people because that's where I'm from. And they gave it to me. So Jeffrey and I started writing back and forth. And he, he wanted to know more about James and Eliza, so I wrote to him. When I, this is when we were writing letters. I mean, we didn't have the internet yet. Writing letters back and forth about the history, about the people, about who was from where, and, and trying to figure out all the little details. Because one of the things I'll talk about later is hearsay. It's not 100%, uh, 100% accurate. So um, by the time um, I decided to no longer portray Eliza, it was about 1988, because she was only 22 at the time, and I really couldn't pass for 22 anymore. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> she, her first child that lived was born in September 1846, which would mean I'd have to wear a pillow every year until September, and then I could say the baby's been born. Uh, so I wasn't willing to do that anymore. Plus, I, I couldn't pass for 22 anymore. Um, her daughter, Anne, was born September 3rd, 1846, at the fort. She was the first. European slash white child born at the fort post the raising of the American flag. So that's pretty darn cool. So fast forward to 2017 and I decided that I was, I was retired to go go see England. So I got in touch with, in touch with Jeffrey and I said, I'd really like to stop and visit. And he said, absolutely. And I've got some papers for you. I thought, all right. Well, he had already written a version of the memoirs, but his version is from James's point of view. And it's more about that side of it than about Eliza's. 
And he knew that I was more interested in the Eliza side, of course. So I went to England. I did a tour with a tour group and then stopped and visited um, Jeffrey and his wife. And they put me up for a couple of nights. They drove me around Lancashire. We went to um, the little village in Derbyshire where um, Eliza's father had a textile mill. We found the side of the mill. It was it's crumbling. It's, I think it might even be gone by now because they were going to put something else there. Just like they did here. Tear down the building, put something else. Um, but the house that she lived in, or houses, because it was a connected building that she lived in, is still there and is still occupied. It's like um, apartments, um, one up, one down type apartments. So I got to see where they were living at the time. She, he took me to the, um, the church that her younger sister was baptized in. It's still there. He took me to, um, to Little Bolton, Lancashire, which is not the same as Bolton. Two different villages, which Augusta found out when she went to England and she went to Bolton and they had a big to do about granddaughter of the former <laughs> residents. And, and she said, but, and then they said, well, where, where in Bolton did he live? She goes, well, he was in Little Bolton. Went, oh, wrong town. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing for everybody. But um, in fact, she, she told me this was this was interesting. She told me that um, got a taxi from the airport to something, and the man who was driving the taxi's last name was Gregson, and she said he looked like her father. So genetics are pretty strange that way. So anyway, um, they took me to um, all these places in England um, and to Liverpool, from which is where they left to come to the U.S. And Liverpool has an excellent museum about Liverpool as its as its. Um, importance as a um, shipping port and about immigration and all that kind of stuff and all this wonderful information to give me a little better feel for the whole thing and they have a mock-up of the hold of a ship an immigration ship in this museum and you walk in and they've got it ambient sound so the the timbers are creaking the sails are flapping and, and then you can almost smell the salt water it's, it's pretty pretty amazing um, and they have a couple of bunks, so you can see the kind of accommodations that people had who, who were coming in the hole. So, pretty cool stuff. And at the end of my visit there, Jeffrey gave me a stack of paper, all the research that he still had that he had not had a chance to compile, uh, because he didn't have any children himself. His um, second wife, who, who he was with at that time, um, her children weren't interested. So he, um, he just gave me all his paper. He had been sending me things over the years, and I'd sent him things over the years. Uh, first in actual hard copy, and later in, in um, electronic form when we both got computers. But one of the interesting things that happens when you're doing research with somebody else is you share information back and forth, and you'll find something, the other person finds something, and they're slightly different. And you've got to figure out which one's right. So we had made discoveries along the way. And so he gave me all this information, so I came back with a whole treasure trove of goodies. Okay, to write a biography, which essentially this is a biography, to write a biography, you need to get accurate information. Now, you can go to places like Ancestry.com, you can go to play other family research, genealogy type sites, and you're going to find some stuff, but you're not, you don't want to take it at face value because people will write things down that they think are accurate, and they're not. So when I started actually putting things down to paper, I realized I need to make sure that what I'm using is the accurate, most accurate I can get. Fortunately, Eliza did mention in her memoirs when her children were born. I figured if anybody knows where your children is born, it's the mother of the children. So I figured those dates were accurate. And the family Bible, um, is in the collection of California State Parks. So I was able to go in there and see that these, these dates are accurate. Um, but you need to have um, as much accuracy as you can find. So you look for things. You look for things like um, birth certificates or uh, marriage licenses, letters, that kind of thing. Um, I didn't find a birth certificate for Eliza. Jeffrey, however, found, okay, here you are, I want to get this out of here. Okay, the bottom, second from the bottom is Eliza's baptismal record. When she was um, baptized in, I can't remember the name of the church, 
I didn't see it, but I can't remember the name of it. Um, it's St. Mary's Church in Manchester. She was uh, baptized on May 23rd, 1824. She was born two months earlier. But you didn't baptize your child right away. You waited to make sure they were away. So she's down there. Mm -hmm. yep. And she is listed as um, Eliza, not Elizabeth. So that's one of the little inaccuracies that you find occasionally is she is Eliza. She never was baptized Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, you look for things like um, naturalization papers. I found out that when James came to the U.S., his family settled in Philadelphia, um, he got his naturalization papers in 1845, a couple of months before they started to come west. So, no, 44. And so I, I found it at the Philadelphia, I don't know if it was a historical society or some one of their historical record keeping places. And I found it online. I said, oh, can I get a copy of this? And the person that I was working said, oh, yeah, no problem. I thought she was just going to make a photocopy. Well, she went in the back, took the real thing, took a picture of it with a photocopy, and gave you the real copy of the real thing. So I've got the real thing. And it listed his father's name as well as his. So I knew I had the right one. Because there were more than one breaks and families in, in the U.S. at that time. You look for military records. You look for ship's passenger lists. I found the ship's passenger list that listed Eliza and her three brothers and her sister and her mother. The father came a couple years earlier and they came to join him. So I found the ship's record. That I found on Ancestry.com. So some things you can find on these big sites. But every once in a while you run into something you go, that's not right. I, somebody in the family, I can't remember who, said that um, Eliza's uh, birth name was Eliza Marshall. Somebody wrote that James Marshall, who discovered gold, was her brother. Totally different family. James Marshall was from New Jersey and had no, had no children. He never got married, had no children, but it's definitely not the same family. I mean, Eliza's brothers were named John and Henry. Her father's name was John. She didn't have a James. So I knew, I knew that one was inaccurate. I don't know where they got that story. Family stories come down and they get tweaked just a little bit. They're not 100%. So you look, if, once you find a written record, you have to look for things that are other primary sources. A primary source is an, a person who's writing that down actually saw it, actually did it, actually went there or whatever. So you look for primary sources because that's the most accurate information you're gonna find. So you, in this case, I primary sources, I pretty much exhausted them with the baptism record and the naturalization record and the ship's manifest with her name on it. But there weren't any that I could find parallel primary sources of people who were in Rhode Island, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where she was, at the same time. I have been to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and talk to the people at the textile mills that they have restored there that they're using for historic research. And they don't have any uh, records of who worked there and who worked in which mill. Um, I gave them the names. They looked, they couldn't find anything. So that particular mill apparently didn't keep their records because both her father, John Marshall, and her um, two older brothers and Eliza all worked in one of the mills. I don't know which one. That would have been a real gem to find is which mill they worked in. But I did go to Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I went to Lowell, Massachusetts, which has even more textile mills. And one of the nice things about Lowell, Massachusetts is in that particular mill complex, which is run by the National Park Service, they have one of the rooms is set up with all these looms, for, as far as the eye can see. And they will turn them on, a few of them on, um, at a certain time each day. And the noise is incredible. And to think that you were working in that environment for like 10 or 12 hour days without earplugs, and there's this noise and there's fluff in the air because textiles put up fluff. And so you were in that environment for a significant amount of your life if you worked there. So it gave me a little sense of what it was like for her. And not only was she thought her husband wasn't stout enough to continue being a, a blacksmith in a industrial complex, she herself would have had health issues if she had eventually if she had stayed working in the textile industry because of the textiles. Yes. Uh, just to mention, uh, my grandmother used to. Uh, she worked in uh, uh, 
a similar textile mill in Lancashire, and pretty much all of her life from a very young child. And the noise was so incredible, you couldn't hear anyone speak. Mm -hmm. You had to learn to lip read and hand sing. So that was it. Yeah. And there were no safety guards. Huh. I mean, it was. I've seen some pictures that the, the illustrations I've seen are drawings, and they're of course cleaned up. They don't show the piles of stuff on the floor or anything like that. But even then, you see these big machines, and there's women with long dresses standing in from these big machines, and you have to not catch your clothing in the machine. And and people would um, there'd be accidents where someone's hand would get in the machine. And, you know, it was it was pretty horrendous. Fortunately, she didn't have any any problems like that. So anyway, um, I had to look for parallel parallel primary sources, is what I call them, things that were written at the same time by people who were actually there. There is something called the New Helvetia Diary, which uh, Captain Sutter and his clerks kept for about three years, including 1846. <laughs> and they wrote who came and who went every day, sometimes what the weather was like, Sometimes there'll be a little you know, so-and-so got married, you know, that kind of thing. But it was basically just a, a daily record of the goings on there at the fort. And James Gregson is listed. Sometimes Mrs. Gregson is listed, not always. Um, her her two brothers that worked there for a while are also listed occasionally. But it gives dates, and that became very useful a little later on because Lies would reference something that happened in certain time and you look in, in the diary and oh, she got that one wrong. So I was able to spot check things because I didn't want to, and you should not, if you're trying to be accurate, use a date that you have not double checked, at least double checked, three times in a day. Um, you try to find eyewitness accounts of people who were there at the same time and saw the same things. And I found um, some things like um, you know, meant of biographies of individuals. Like there's been a couple of biographies written about James, John Sutter. There have been biographies written about James Marshall, actually only one, um, and about Fremont, who their flag was all, and about the Donner family, and the Donner Party, because Eliza was there at the fort when the the um, survivors of the Donner Party came down the ranks, and she wrote about that. So there's these insights that you and I wouldn't even think of because she was there, she saw this stuff. Um, you try to look for things like newspapers are, are good, they're kind of halfway primary, halfway secondary source because they may be giving an eyewitness account, but sometimes they're getting it from somewhere else and they're not, it's not 100% accurate. Um, you try to find things like um, histories of the area, you know, what happened at this time, etc. Um, and you're, what you're trying to do is verify, verify the facts, because your memories are fuzzy. Like, Eliza didn't write anything about the ocean voyage to, Cal to the United States. Nothing. She wrote this long thing about how they got to Liverpool, and she didn't say anything. So they got to Rhode Island, they like, nothing about the ocean voyage. It's like, well, I gotta put something in. Fortunately, Jeffrey Timmington had written some stuff that he got from somewhere else about the ocean voyage. So I used a little bit of what he wrote, and then I just pretty much said, and I've forgotten more than I want to remember in the book, because she didn't write anything about, so obviously it wasn't important to her. Um, but she, I, I talked to people who have been on ocean voyages, like on, on, on cruise ships, and they said one of the things that really they remembered distinctly was salt encrusting things, like on, on the deck. On the spray from the from the waves, you get up on the deck and you have crust, salt crusts on the on the um, the decks and on the railing as that show. I mentioned that um, in about I think it was about 2010. I can't remember exactly, and I didn't get around to looking for it. I had the opportunity to be uh, part of a group that we went on the uh, Lady Washington and the Hawaiian Chieftain, two tall ships from the mid 1840s that are replicas um, that are based in Washington State, but have been going up and down the coast for years. And one of them, about actually both of them, were going to be in San Francisco Bay. Um, and we got together a group of people from the Sutter's Fort volunteers and other volunteers that lived in the Bay Area to go and take a crew, a three-hour cruise, on these two ships. And we went in period clothing. So I was able to go on one of these ships and go out in the bay 
Fortunately, it was not a rocky day because I probably would have gotten seasick. Uh, but I was able to go up and down the ladder that goes down into the hole that she would have in a long dress. So I found out what that was like. So these are the sensory type things that you want to have knowledge of so that you can relate them to whoever's reading this book. Um, and then Eliza wrote something. I have to read this to you because it, it sort of caught me off, off guard. Um, in the second page of her memory, at the very bottom, it says, they left the settlements. Um, and then she says, this is, they left Illinois, okay? And then she writes, nothing of a special interest occurred until we arrived at Fort Hall. Fort Hall's in Idaho. They left for Missouri. That's a thousand miles. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> she wrote nothing about that thousand miles. So in 2019, I was getting to the point where I said, okay, I've got to write all, I've got to put it together. In 2019, I flew to St. Louis, I ran a car, and I drove the California Trail from St. Louis to, um, to South Salt Lake City. I've been to the desert in, from here to Salt Lake City. So I don't need to go there again. It was bad luck the first time. Um, so I did experience that. And it was, it really surprised me that she didn't remember these things. Because, I mean, there are things like the um, um, Independence, there's Independence Rock, there's, um, I got pictures here, okay. So there's Jailhouse Rock, and there's Courthouse Rock, and there's Chimney Rock, and I was able to visit all those places and write about them from her point of view, because other people who had traveled the same trail had written about it in their diaries. And interestingly enough, none of them wrote about Jailhouse Rock and Courthouse Rock. And those two I was able to go right up to. Chimney Rock is on private land. They've got it all fenced off. You can go to the visitor center and look out the window at Chimney Rock, but you can't go up to it. And it's probably better that way because people started chipping it along, you know, because people like to do that. But um, I walked out to Jailhouse Rock and um, Courthouse Rock, and they're just a short ways off off the highway, and I drove out and parked this little bitty parking lot, dirt parking lot, and I walked over to them. And I tried to do this at the same time of the year that they came west, which was in August. This part of the trip would have been in August. And a couple of things jumped out at me. There were grasshoppers or something similar hopping all around in the grass. The rocks when we got from they're very crumbly. They're like sandstone, I think. And they're very crumbly. They just like flake off. And so I use that information to um, visually illustrate that section of the book about her trip across across the plains. The chimney chimney rock, it looks like a chimney, but she said, I would assume that she realized that looked like the chimney stacks of the textile mills that she worked in in the East. So I was trying to draw personal, my personal experience into what she would have seen. I found a, um, another a diary of a fellow who was coming across at the very same time she was his party and her party they kind of like draw it across each other they were going back and forth had they pass each other and somebody else would pass them you know that kind of thing and he wrote down everything this man was way too detailed -oriented. he wrote down every day how many miles they went how far they went what happened that kind of thing so i was able to use his diary entries to fill out that section of the story that she had not written about um, there were other diaries. There are um, a series of books called Covered Wagon Women that um, were compiled. I can't remember who compiled them. Um, but they, there's um, a volume about um, pre, before the Donner Party and then a, a, a section from the Donner Party to Gold Rush and the rest of Gold Rush. So there are a series of books and most of those women were writing after the fact or they were writing um, they didn't a line or two while they were traveling and then they stopped writing and that kind of thing. So I had that information to work from as well. And I, I have a, a very good library of a lot of books that were written in the early 80s. There was a big interest in women's history at that time. So I've got an extensive library of women's diaries from that time period. So I was trying to find parallel information that I could use. As I mentioned before, the um, New Havisha Diary was a good source because it said who was where, when they were there, that, that kind of thing. And one of the things that the family has always been 
not care about, because Eliza doesn't say, were they at Palomo when gold was discovered? So there's, which side says yes, and the other side says no. I, I have, I believe, verified that no, they were not there. Because, as I said, said the New Alicia diary gives who was where and where they went and that kind of thing. Um, James Marshall brought the gold down to um, Sutter's Fort about January 26th. It was discovered on January 24th. He brought it down about the 26th for uh, Sutter to look at and determine if it was real or not. Well, James was in Sonoma at the time because that was in the diary. Sent Gregson to Sonoma. Sent Gregson here. And then a couple of days later, Gregson has returned. So he was not at the fort when so when Marshall brought the gold there. So how could he have been at Columbia if he was in Sonoma? So I knew that he wasn't, they weren't there at the time. Eliza is rather fuzzy on that. She just talks about um, gold was discovered and we saw the gold and we didn't believe it was gold and that kind of thing. Well, that could have happened after the kid, after the fact. Um, they went, actually went to Coloma after the gold discovery incident because um, they need another blacksmith there, and James is a blacksmith. And um, Eliza's role was to take over the cooking for the mill workers and the whole um, cadre of people working there from a woman who had been doing it, um, Jenny Winter, who apparently, um, her attitude and the attitude of the mill worker and the mill did not jive. Um, she thought, I'm the boss of the food. When I tell you dinner's ready, you come and get it. If you don't come and get it, that's too bad. Well, they didn't like that. <laughs> If they thought she should hold dinner for them, and instead they, they said that she gave all the best pieces to her, her family, because she had like three kids and a husband. And what they didn't, what was not written down is she was pregnant at the time, and I think she was just plain cranky. Uh, because we get, we get cranky when we're pregnant. Those of you who have had children, I got cranky. Um, we get cranky, and we want our family to have the best, because that's the way we are. And so anyway, um, so her her husband and Jenny and their children went to another nearby location. So Eliza was to take her place. So I knew about when the winners left. So I knew about when the Gregsons got there. Um, so like I said, there are things that are a little fuzzy, and you try to fill in the gaps. When I started writing this, um, my background is in history and interpretation of history. And I started writing it as a historic research paper. And it just wasn't working. I thought, well, because what I was doing is I would write, Eliza was born in Manchester, in, in uh, Lancashire, England. And then I would follow it with, in quotations, what she wrote about herself being born in, Lanc in Manchester. I thought, that's kind of boring. I wouldn't want to read that myself. So I thought, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this using her words, but cleaning them up a little bit. So if I didn't do the misspellings. My punctuations and a capitalization were much better than hers. Um, and I didn't have to deal with the fact that her chronology kind of jumped around. So I was able to, with the research I'd done and Jeffrey Tennington's research, I was able to organize things better. So I wrote it as if I was Eliza telling her story to her family. And then it flowed. It just flowed right out. I just had to make sure I put the right things in the right place. Um, so I limited the timeline of the book to her life. She died in 1889. So um, I may have mentioned um, daughter so-and-so got married to so-and-so, but I didn't go into their children because that's after her lifetime. Well, maybe they may had one or two kids by then, but um, I wrote it up to the end of her memoirs and the end of her life because one of the last lines she writes is after um all the children had moved out and it's just her and her husband she's after 40 years of marriage it's again just us two and that's what that's what she wrote pretty much so i wrote about um what she experienced her life i did include uh, the section of her husband's memoirs statement to the bancroft's um clerk about what he saw during the bear flag revolt because Eliza wasn't there, but I couldn't leave it out. So I did a whole a chapter about his experiences as if this is what my husband told me. 
of his experiences and being part of that rebellion and being shot at and all that kind of stuff. And I included um, at the back of the book, there's an appendix that gives um, the uh, family tree for her parents and then James and Eliza's children and then for each of their children, who they married and what name they Memory's fuzzy. Um, and how many kids they had, that kind of thing. But I didn't go into the children because I knew I was going to start to run into problems because, again, genealogy is not as exact as we would like it to be. And in the back of the book, there's a, a biography, a series of biographies, a paragraph or two about the individuals that she met, like John Sutter and, and James Marshall and um, some of the other people that she met. And it really it gave me parameters to work with because I mean, you want to take do the person's whole life, but going beyond their life without something to base it on, it was too cloudy for me. I didn't want to. I didn't want to deal with that. I had to put. It, I had to put an end to it. So I put it into it as when she died. This is the way things were at the time that she died. So, as I said earlier, um, I was portraying Eliza um, for a couple of years until I got to be too old, and. I realized that if I was ever going to portray her accurately, I needed to know something about the things that she knew, which is why there's a good textile mills. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm a seamstress myself, so I did know about that. Um, she had apparently known how to knit lace, because uh, she had knitted the lace that was on her uh, granddaughter's apron. And so I learned how to knit lace. I made just enough to make this trimming for two cuffs, as that was enough. The needles, I don't know how many of you knit, but the needles for knitting, like three zero or four zero needles, teeny tiny little needles, and the cotton thread slips right off. <laughs> it was very frustrating. I mean, I'm a decent knitter, but I'm no, nowhere near what they were, obviously. I never did learn how to spin or how to, how to use a loom, but um, I wanted to experience some of the things that, um, that she experienced. So I've been to um, the California Trail Center in Elko, Nevada, which is about eight miles this side of Elko, Nevada, actually. And they have a California Trail Days every year. Um, this year it was the first uh, weekend in June. And um, for two days, they have an encampment outside the trail center of people dressed in funny looking clothes and talking about what it was like to be on the trail. So I could, having done that and experienced it, complete with the bad weather, the dust, now let's, I could write about that. These are the things that happened on the trail on a regular basis. I've driven across the desert where they went across the desert. I've driven across it several times, so I know what it looks like. I know what, when you drive across this desert, it's flat, it's boring. And back there in the distance, you can see there's mountains, but you can't tell how far away they are because distances are really funny in the desert. So I wrote about that in the book because these are things that she would have experienced. Um, I've been to um, a couple of places back east that have uh, textile mills, like I mentioned, you know, Rhode Island and, um, and Massachusetts. Um, I belong to an organization called the Association of Living History Farms and Agricultural Museums. Very long thing. Um, and it's a one, once a year we have a conference. And one of the benefits of this conference is you get to try things that you've never tried before. And like this most recent one, I just got back last week, I learned how to marble paper, which is pretty cool. I mean, I use marble paper, I bought marble paper, but I got to actually do it myself. And it's a skill that you definitely have to practice and learn. It's not, it's, it's pretty simple to just to put the, the paint on the water and put the paper in it and all that, but there's a skill to it that you, you have to refine over the years. Um, I learned how to drive a team of horses. I learned how to plow. I can plow a relatively straight line. Um, I would never sign up to be the person plowing that field because it's way more work than, I mean, they grew up doing it. To them, it was, this was just what you did. But it's it's difficult. It's not just, you know, pitch up the horse and go. You've got to, there's a whole lot more involved in that. And Alfam does an annual plowing contest. So every year, part of the conference is a plowing contest, and people who from all over the United States are there, and they'll do a plowing contest. Well, because I, the first year I learned it, I entered a plowing contest, and I was in the rank amateur section. I didn't even close. And I think there were like 10 of us, and I was like the middle. 
in that group because it wasn't straight, um, it was up and down, um, and there are a number of things. You, you have to, things you learn with practice. So I can say I've done it. I know what it's like. I, I have never hitched up a, a team of horses, but I've learned how to drive one in an enclosed arena. I would try to do it on the street. But you learn how to do things, as I did, to enhance your character. So that when I was writing about her life, I had some personal experience to be able to write about these things. Um, so I'd done all these things, I'd experienced these things, and then COVID happened. And I'd been gathering this information for 40 years, since I started in, in, was it in, in 1983, up to 22, 22 when I finally wrote it all down. But COVID happened and I couldn't go anywhere. I pretty much had to stand myself. This is a good time to sit down and put it all together. So I sat down and put it all together and, and wrote it up. I tried a couple of publishers. Nobody was interested. But okay, I'm going to do it myself. So I used Kindle Direct Publishing. And because then I could write it. And even though I had to do like half a dozen reviews to get it all right, because you know, forget comma, and too many spaces, you misspell a word, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's something I would have paid a publishing company to do, but I did it myself. And a number of the sources that I use, they, the names are not um, standardized spelling that we use now. So it would have flagged every time. So I was able to go, no, that's still right, that's still right, that's still right. Got all the way through it. I could place the pictures where I wanted to place them. Um, and I was able to lay it out the way I wanted. And you can't beat the price. So anyway, you know, they, one of the things they you, you hear when you're first learning how to write anything is write what you know. So that's what I tried to do. I tried to write what I know. And I learned how to walk the walk so I could talk the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? This way you just don't plow. <laughs> plow? Yeah. Yellow you. Yeah. Yeah. No, P L O W. That's the way you spell it. You spell it with a W. I'm just curious how old Eliza was. It's 1826. 22. She was born in 1824. She was 22 at that time. And when they came west, she was 21. Because they came west in 45. What year? So how old? 1889. So she would have been 65, 67. It's a It was. And her husband lived another 10 years. So, I don't know, from a man who wasn't stout, that's pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, by that time, they had the house built and the children around them and, and all that. They had a um, they had a, an orchard, they had wheat fields. Um, they didn't do much in the way of, um, James tried to set up a blacksmith shop on the property and they did okay. But it was not something that was enough to keep body and soul together. So they pretty much did. That was like as a side, side thing. Um, they grew a lot of crops that they could dry, like peaches and apples and stuff like that. And she mentions him going to um, the Washoe House, which is on um, Petaluma River, to go there to go downriver to sell their dried fruits to um, San Francisco brokers for the restaurants and such in San Francisco. So you know, they, they made enough. Apparently they were made very good cheese because um, they got a medal for cheese and uh, butter as well. They got a medal for butter and, and the, the prize was a uh, silver butter knife, which the, somebody in the family still has. Oh, incidentally, um, her actual handwritten memory, gone. Nobody knows where it is. I've checked with the California Historical Society. I've checked with the Society of California Pioneers. I've, I've checked with everyone I can check with. Nobody has it. Augusta told me that someone, and I can't remember who it was at this point, was helping one of her aunts with her papers. Um, and when she died, they had, they said, oh, we'll take care of all your papers and things. Well, apparently they threw it out. So, because to them, it would have looked like a bunch of scratchings on paper. It was important. Fortunately, Augusta had typed it up and it was printed in the California Historical Society's newsletter, quarterly. And that was, and they made it into a book. They thought it was important enough to make it something other than just an article in the news, in the quarterly newsletter, quarterly magazine. 
soon have an answer to this question, but because I bought a copy of your book. But point of view, did you write it from Eliza's point of view? Yes. Telling, you mentioned something about telling talking to your family. Yes. So that oh. Well, because I assume, maybe I'm wrong, but I assume that when she wrote down those memories, she wrote them for her family. Yeah. Because nobody was going to publish them. I mean, she knew that Bancroft's clerk wasn't going to come back and take them. I mean, as far as I know, the only women's voices that were in anything published was post event. And um, it was written in, I think the book is called Testimonials. I could have that wrong. But it's a number of uh, statements written by California Mexican American women who were interviewed by the clerks. One of the Spanish speaking clerks wrote these things down and they've been translated and put into a book, which is fascinating information, but it's not handwritten by her. So for people who want to do California history mm -hmm. research, where is the Sutter The New Helvetia Diary has been published the actual handwritten one copy of it is at the Society of California Pioneers. You can see it if you want to go and see it. Where, where is that? San Francisco. Okay. I have seen it. I know the California State Library has a California history book. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. It's um, are there other places in Sacramento that you know of? Um, uh, California State Parks has some stuff. Not a lot. Um, getting in to see them can be problematic. Having worked there and knowing people, I was able to get in and see things. Um, in fact, they're the ones who gave me permission to put the picture on the cover because everybody else I found, they didn't have the original. Nobody has the original picture. That's another thing that got lost. But the California State Parks has an excellent copy of it. And since it's not an original, nobody can claim ownership of it, so they set up to do so. So that was one of the other things I ran into is if you're going to use a photograph, of somebody, you have to get permission from the original source of that photograph. I mean, if they've given it to a library or some kind of historical society, you can go through them. But I have a whole stack of letters that I got back from various sources that said, yes, you can use this picture, and sending me a copy of that picture, because that's it's all part of copyright. Isn't there a time limit on copyright the photographs? There is. I don't know what it is. Um, I would, that's one of the things I thought was, since this picture was taken about 1860, there was no, no exact date, but from the clothing we figure it's 1860. We figured that, I figured that it would be out of copyright, but <laughs> nobody was willing to give me the go ahead until the state parks gave me the go ahead. So I, I give them credit. Hmm. I was talking about the of the person. But would it be lifetime of the person or lifetime of the person who took the picture? Uh, it's it's really uh, all codified. You can find it. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I, you know, all of a sudden I'm I, I can't remember, but it's all written down. It's University of Minnesota. Don't jump quote me. Okay, it's on the website. Just Google copyright laws yeah. and bing, it shows up. Written stuff is different than images, you yes. know, and yeah, and sometimes it can be within the family, they can own it, it. And there's also issues about things like Getty collection for their mm -hmm. photographs, which they, the, they charge, and I don't know how they I ran it. into that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah I, I don't remember. And they seem to exceed whatever the, the defines copyright dates are. Yeah. yeah, but I, I did have to pay to use I did have to pay to use a few a few of the pictures and others they were free. Like I got a couple from the state library and they said, Yeah, go ahead. All the maps that are in here were drawn by um, Jeffrey Timmington when he wrote his biography of of, um, of James. And he said, Yeah, go ahead and use it. Okay. I got his permission. Just the interesting thing, when I was uh, filing my first patent, my attorney showed me, he, was in Palo Alto. he showed me a book where Eli Whitney didn't invent the, the cotton, gin? cotton gin, a woman did, a woman hired him, oh. paid him, drew the pictures for him, but a woman put him on the patent. I'm not surprised. And so he filed a patent. I am not surprised. Unfortunate, yeah. but true. 
there's a lot of famous famous women who were scientists and mathematicians. Sure. Who are yeah. There are many books. The, yeah. the only all it says to the author is a lady. Yeah. Or um, a gentlewoman or something like that. Yeah. It just wasn't the thing. You didn't do that. I mean, you only got mentioned if you were mentioned at all. Um, when you got married, and when you died. If your family was well known enough, you'd be in the birth column, but not if you were the daughter of a mill worker, which Eliza was. That wasn't in the newspapers. Um, it was in the baptism papers. And you had to know that baptisms didn't happen at the same time as the child was born. It was a couple months later. In fact, her younger sister, I'll give you a little insight to this, her father left because he ran up debts and couldn't pay them. So he left to go to the US. And when he left, her younger, her younger sister was only like three months old. and hadn't been baptized yet. You have to pay to baptize your child. Hadn't been baptized yet. So um, they moved to the next village over where hopefully were her father's um, indiscretions were even known. So they moved to the next village over and it wasn't until two years later that her mother finally got the child baptized. So her baptism record shows her as being, I think, two and a half or three years old. But it, it puts down for her mother, I think it says something like, widow? And she wasn't a widow. Her husband was still alive. But that's what they put down. Because they didn't want to say she was illegitimate. And she was a legitimate child. So yeah, you things don't always get written down when they should get written down, unfortunately. Thank you. Good morning. I said you could help me in 20 minutes. I think How much did, did I do? Uh, an hour. Oh my gosh. I'm that's sorry. That's, that's perfectly fine. I got carried away. You pushed the right button. I got carried away. There well, thank you, Zoomers. So, uh, okay. thank you, thank you.